It is uh, my great joy and privilege to introduce Bill Huang. Can we please welcome Bill Huang up here? Please welcome Bill Huang. The question of who is Bill Wong is one that everyone seems to be asking right now. Here is someone who really was not on anyone's radar and yet he was ranking among the world's wealthiest people. But now Bill Huang and what has happened to his firm will likely go down in 2021 as one of the most remarkable stories of the year, not just because of the rapid rise, but the even faster implosion. He was an outsized influence in financial markets, but almost nobody had ever heard his name, and nobody had ever heard the name of his firm, Arkegos, Arkegos Capital, Capital Management. Management. This whole situation to me is like a string of, are you effing kidding me? How could that many prime brokers be so dumb as to lever up one guy all on the same stocks? It really is every bank for themselves at this point. It was this one family office that caused so much mayhem. It was Bill Huang's personal fortune, which he had built into a firm that was pretty sizable in the market. One way to measure this fiasco is by adding up Bill Huang's losses, $20 billion, to the $10 billion that the banks have lost. In total, you've got $30 billion wiped out in the space of a week. Investors on Wall Street lose money all the time. But Arkegos is almost unique in financial history because of the size of the positions that a single individual accumulated and the speed with which it unraveled. This is one of the most spectacular failures in modern financial history. No individual has lost so much money so quickly. My entry point to the Archego story was Goldman Sachs. Very early on, Goldman emerged as a seller of almost $10 billion of securities on a Friday, dumping stock onto the market in a way that was exceedingly rare, almost unprecedented. And any time I see the name Goldman Sachs, I'm always curious. And so I went down the Goldman Sachs rabbit hole and found out some interesting details about Goldman's relationship with this firm Archegos and the man behind it, Bill Wong. It really goes back to the final days of March when you had this frenzy of block trades hitting the market. There were a bunch of big Chinese tech names, US media conglomerates, and across the board, we were seeing the stocks falling. Everyone in the market was trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Bill Huang's background is very different from anyone else that you've heard of at the pinnacle of Wall Street. Here's someone who grew up in a family of modest means in South Korea. His father was a pastor. He was assigned to a church in Las Vegas, and Bill Huang and his family moved to the United States when he was about 18 years old in 1982. Within a few months of his arrival, his father passed away. He used to work night shifts at McDonald's. And it was on his mother's insistence that he go to college, that he attended UCLA and subsequently earned a business degree at Carnegie Mellon. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, it wasn't so easy to get to Wall Street if you were an immigrant. He couldn't get a job at Goldman Sachs. He couldn't get a job at Morgan Stanley. Yet his dream was to come to New York City. So Bill Wong ended up taking a job at Hyundai Securities, and he turned out to be a very good securities salesman at Hyundai Securities because he caught the attention of Julian Robertson. We have worked. Julian Robertson is the famous hedge fund manager who founded the powerhouse firm Tiger Management. And so Bill Wong became a Tiger Cub. The term Tiger Cub is used to describe the former employees, disciples, if you like, of Julian Robertson. Anyone who sort of worked with Julian Robertson had great success under him and then was able to spin out and start their own hedge fund or their own investing firm came to be known as the Tiger Cup. Julian Robertson seeded Bill Huang's hedge fund and that's what gave Tiger Asia its start. 
Bill Wong's hedge fund, Tiger Asia, was a very, very successful firm. At one point, it managed $10 billion. But Tiger Asia crossed the line between aggressive and illegal. In 2012, securities regulators across the world accused the firm of insider trading. Bill Huang had to plead guilty on behalf of his hedge fund for wire fraud. He had to shut down Tiger Asia. But after he settled that and he shut down his hedge fund, he started Archegos. Archegos is what's known as a family office. It's an investment firm managing money for an individual, in this case, Bill Wong. But instead of trying to start a new hedge fund with the taint of a securities violation, he would take the money that he had, something north of $200 million at the time, and invest his own money, hire his own analysts, do his own work, and make money that way instead of having to make money for clients. And he was incredibly successful. He did a couple of things that worked very well in his favor. The first was he invested in tech stocks. He rode the decade-long boom in firms like Amazon, LinkedIn, Expedia. Netflix, Facebook, Google. The other thing he did increasingly was use borrowed money. On Wall Street, it's called leverage. He had borrowed a lot of money and that meant his gains were exacerbated, and he then plowed them all back into the same bets, that by the end of it, you had someone who had taken a fortune that started at a little over 200 million, and in under seven years, had taken it to over $20 billion. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, you'll never be hungry again. Bill Huang was someone who was devoted to his church, who was focused on the idea of spreading the word of Christ. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. He believed that by investing in these companies, he was advancing society on behalf of God. My company does a little bit of our part bringing the fair price to Google stock price. Is it important to God? Absolutely. In some ways, he was able to find a justification for all his wages, to stick with them, and to double down on them, irrespective or not being mindful of the hedges he would have had to have in place. He talks about this idea that everyone else on Wall Street is burdened by the thought of being powerful and having too much money. And he says he doesn't feel it. He says he's not afraid of death or money. He says, I am just following God's word, and that is truly a fearless way to invest. He didn't live large. He didn't have a penthouse apartment in New York City. He didn't have a fancy vacation home in the Hamptons. He lived a relatively modest life in suburban New Jersey. He drove a Hyundai SUV. This is really a grown-up version of someone you will see on Wall Street bets or Robin Hood. This is someone who really likes a stock or two or three, would bet on it and stick with it and not worry about anything else. There was no complicated investing strategy here. God has clearly showed us what money does in a positive way. Here, someone who's completely driven by faith who completely believed in the right of what he was doing and allowed that to become the driving force, not allowing any sort of distraction for self-doubt or even second thought in what he was doing. And that proved to be his undoing. On the afternoon of March 22nd, Viacom CBS announced a stock and convertible bond sale. The company wanted to raise $3 billion. Here was a stock Bill Huang was really invested in. He had a huge outsized position in it. Every time the stock moved up, he would throw more money into it, and the stock would keep going up and up and up and up. Instead of helping the stock, this stock sale hurt the stock terribly. The following day, Viacom CBS went down 9%. On the Wednesday, it went down 23%. With the stock declining that far that fast, it forced a margin call. A margin call is a demand by Wall Street firms for more collateral. If you've borrowed so much money that all of a sudden there's no equity left, 
after a stock drops that quickly, the firm will demand more collateral. If Bill Wong has no money left or refuses to put up any further money, the dealing firm takes over his position. The Wall Street dealers pleaded with Bill Wong to sell some stock so that he would at least survive. He might take some losses. From $20 billion, he might go down to 10 or perhaps even less, but he would live to fight another day. And Bill Wong refused. If it was just one bank making the demand, that might have been fine. When all his banks made the same demand, you knew you had a problem, and really, that was the beginning of the end for Bill Huang. Any fortune built on borrowed money is standing on a shaky base. A gust of wind could threaten it. In the case of Bill Huang, he was facing down a hurricane. Names that he had plowed billions of dollars into were moving against him. And he never had any effective hedge. The banks had started to panic. They had loaned him a lot of money and they were demanding that he needs to post a lot more cash. Otherwise, they would have to terminate the agreement and liquidate his portfolio. He did not have enough spare cash lying around and they did have to cut their ties and liquidate his entire portfolio. In the end, Bill Huang lost it all. But not just that. The banks that had lent him money, they also lost quite the fortune. Think of Archegos as a burning building and its bank lenders as the people trapped inside. The moment one of those people, one of those banks makes a break for the exit, all hell breaks loose. You had someone like Credit Suisse losing $5.5 billion. Nomura in Japan losing in excess of $2.5 billion. And yet you had banks like Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Deutsche Bank, who seem to have escaped this largely unscathed. In total, you've got $30 billion wiped out in the space of a week. The last person out of the burning building is the one who always sustains the greatest damage. In this case, that was Credit Suisse. It was only in the days after that that we were able to piece together what really happened and the root cause behind it all. A whale is Wall Street slang for someone who wields outsized influence in financial markets. It's like looking at the ocean and seeing a glass-like surface, but under the surface is this enormous, enormous creature. That's what Bill Wong was like to Wall Street. He was an invisible whale. Almost nobody had ever heard his name, and nobody had ever heard the name of his firm. And that all goes back to this financial instrument that he used, which was swaps. Now, what are swaps? And swaps are a type of derivative that allows you to effectively remain invisible. Instead of your name showing up in securities filings, it's the name of the firm you're dealing with that shows up. So it could be Credit Suisse. It could be Goldman Sachs. It could be Deutsche Bank. It's the banks that appeared as the stockholders, and he was the one benefiting from the move in the price of the stock. And that would allow him to remain anonymous through that process. The people familiar with Archegos, both its accounts and its positions, spoke to us on the condition of anonymity because they weren't authorized to comment. We don't really have a good idea what Bill Wong has left. We know he's got a suburban home in New Jersey. We know he drove a Hyundai. Presumably, he's still got that. But we're not aware of any other investments that he may have had. But with so little financial disclosure available, it's very difficult for anybody to have a really solid idea of, of what Bill Wong has left after this collapse. The only saving grace, perhaps, from this entire fiasco is that we really haven't seen a systemic problem. We really haven't seen banks en masse pull back risk, expose more hedge funds to the problems and see more dominoes falling. However, what is the lesson that we all learn from what happened to Archegos? So far, the prime brokerage business hadn't been top of mind for regulators, hadn't been top of mind for politicians, but you've had both entities jumping into the fray 
for now demanding answers, for now trying to figure out how stable and sound the system was. You don't want these invisible whales out there who have great outsized holdings in stock and no one knows about it. So the same disclosure rules that apply for hedge funds will possibly be the case going forward for family offices. Bill Wong has undoubtedly suffered some reputational damage as a result of the collapse of his firm. And it's hard not to see the irony in this story. On the one hand, you've got Bill Wong, the pillar of his church community. And on the other, you have this guy who's making wildly speculative bets with enormous amounts of borrowed money. It's so hard to bring those two people together into the same person, which is why we keep asking ourselves why.